shadow, not a conscious act on Kay's part. He had probably already lost consciousness, or perhaps he had been giving me a gentle smile of eternal parting. The intense look of hatred I thought I saw on his face had been nothing but a reflection of the profound terror that had taken control of me for the moment. Now, this is a compelling part of our story, so let's get it in our notes. I want to come back to page 142 and to paragraphs 51 52. Notice that as he begins to look at the works of art, he realizes the joy of his earlier life. Notice he realized that his eyes, Kay's eyes, were my eyes, that I myself had looked upon the world back then with the same lively, unclouded vision as the boy who had walked by my side. The power of art to somehow help one deal with tragedy. Let's put it in our notes. It's a compelling idea. It is through this power of art that our speaker then comes to his epiphany, his insight. This idea that maybe he had lived all his life with these terrible feelings that Kay is judging him in some way, holding him accountable or responsible for something that in the end he couldn't have been responsible for. He was a child at the time. That is to say, we're going to find that art will leave, lead to this epiphany, this understanding, and then hopefully some kind of forgiveness. Let's now finish the story up. The more I studied Kay's watercolor that evening, the greater the conviction with which I began to believe these new thoughts of mine. For no matter how long I continued to look at the picture, I could find nothing in it but a boy's gentle, innocent spirit. I went on sitting at my desk for a very long time. There was nothing else I could do. The sun went down, and the pale darkness of evening began to envelop the room. Then came the deep silence of night, which seemed to go on forever. At last the scales tipped, and dark gave way to dawn. The new day's sun tinged the sky with pink. It was then I knew I must go back. I threw a few things in a bag, called the company to say I would not be in, and boarded a train for my old hometown. I did not find the same quiet little seaside town that I remembered. An industrial city had sprung up nearby during the rapid development of the 60s. Let's pause for just a moment because it's so profound in this story. Notice that in paragraph 55, Paragraph 54, ending with the idea of a boy's gentle, innocent spirit. The identification, obviously, with Kay. But notice here in paragraph 55, he says, I, I, I was working through this understanding. This epiphany is the word we use, so we'll continue to use it. This insight, this understanding. But notice at last, he says, the scales tipped. Now, what are we doing here? Well, this is an allusion to a very ancient mythic idea that Zeus in Greek mythology has scales in terms of what's, uh, what's um, appropriate or whatever. And he knew, paragraph 56, he knew he had to go back. Now he goes back. Let's go ahead and finish the story. In great changes to the landscape, the one little gift shop by the station had grown into a mall, and the town's only movie theater had been turned into a supermarket. My house was no longer there. It had been demolished some months before, leaving only a scrape on the earth. The trees in the yard had all been cut down, and patches of weeds dotted the black stretch of ground. Kay's old house had disappeared as well, having been replaced by a concrete parking lot full of commuters' cars and vans. Change, right? Change. was overcome by sentiment. The town had ceased to be mine long before. I walked down to the shore and climbed the steps of the breakwater. On the other side, as always, the ocean stretched off into the distance, unobstructed, huge, the horizon a single straight line. The shoreline, too, looked the same as it had before. The long beach, the lapping waves, people strolling at the water's edge. The time was after four o'clock, and the soft sun of late afternoon embraced everything below as it began its long, almost meditative descent to the west. I lowered my bag to the sand and sat down next to it in silent appreciation of the gentle seascape. Looking at this scene, 
It was impossible to imagine that a great typhoon had once raged here, that a massive wave had swallowed my best friend and all the world. There was almost no one left now, surely, who remembered those terrible events. It began to seem as if the whole thing were an illusion that I had dreamed up in vivid detail. And then I realized that the deep darkness inside me had vanished, suddenly, Powerful, as suddenly right? as it had come. I raised myself from the sand, and without bothering to take off my shoes or roll up my cuffs, walked into the surf to let the waves lap at my ankles. Almost in reconciliation, it seemed, the same waves that had washed up on the beach when I was a boy were now fondly washing my feet, soaking black my shoes and pant cuffs. There would be one slow-moving wave, then a long pause, and then another wave would come and go. The people passing by gave me odd looks, but I didn't care. I looked up at the sky. A few gray cotton chunks of cloud hung there, motionless. They seemed to be there for me, though I'm not sure why I felt that way. I remembered having looked up at the sky like this in search of the eye of the typhoon. And then inside me, the axis of time gave one great heave. Forty long years collapsed like a dilapidated house, mixing old time and new time together in a single swirling mass. All sounds faded, and the light around me shuddered. I lost my balance and fell into the waves. My heart throbbed at the back of my throat, and my arms and legs lost all sensation. I lay that way for a long time, face in the water, unable to stand. But I was not afraid. No, not at all. There was no longer anything for me to fear. Those days were gone. I stopped having my terrible nightmares. I no longer wake up screaming in the middle of the night, and I am trying now to start life over again. No, I know it's probably too late to start again. I may not have much time left to live. But even if it comes too late, I am grateful that, in the end, I was able to attain a kind of salvation, to effect some sort of recovery. Yes, grateful. I could have come to the end of my life unsaved, still screaming in the dark, afraid. The seventh man fell silent and turned his gaze upon each of the others. No one spoke or moved or even seemed to breathe. All were waiting for the rest of his story. Outside, the wind had fallen, and nothing stirred. The seventh man brought his hand to his collar once again, as if in search of words. They tell us that the only thing we have to fear <coughs> is fear itself. But I don't believe that, he said. Then a moment later, he added, Oh, the fear is there, all right. It comes to us in many different forms, at different times, and overwhelms us. But the most frightening thing we can do at such times is to turn our backs on it, to close our eyes. For then, we take the most precious thing inside us and surrender it to something else. In my case, that something was the wave. Now, the compelling nature of the end of this story, we have to analyze it here quickly. Notice he'll go back. He stands at the shoreline 40 years later. It still is something he's trying to process and live through. And then all of a sudden we're told there's this strange moment when it all seems almost like an illusion at the top of page 144 in paragraph 59. It, almost as if all the dreams that he had in vivid detail are there. And then he says he realizes that the deep darkness inside of him had vanished and we have... The reconciliation will be the word that gets used in paragraph 61. Salvation will be the word in 63. Recovery as well in paragraph 63. Notice we've got the powerful imagery of water washing him clean, the redemptive nature of water as he walks out into the, out into the water. Notice everything's being soaked black by the water, his shoes, his pant cuffs. But he doesn't care, and he doesn't care that people as well are looking at him like, 
What's going on with him? He looks up at the sky, which takes us back to the day, of course, that all of this tragedy happened. And inside, we're told in paragraph 62, the axis of time, we're back to the notion of the scales, just like I was talking about the famous scales that we'll study when we read the Odyssey or the Iliad or um, even Milton's Paradise Lost. These are all 3A observations. The idea of scales, in other words, justice in some way. And then all of a sudden, time just kind of swirls. Notice he falls into the water, a baptism of sorts, we might say, right? And he doesn't seem to care the possibility that he could drown. What's happening to his fear? Go ahead and jot it down. What's going on here in this pivotal moment with all of his fear? It's over. It's ended. And he says that it was a kind of salvation, some kind of recovery. And he says he's grateful for it, right? I could have come to the end of my life unsaved still screaming in the dark, afraid. This is a story of redemption, isn't it, at the very end? Of course, the very end of the story now, to take us back to the beginning of the story, he said, we have a break. Now, uh, put it in your notes at 3A. We're going to see this kind of thing in Joseph Conrad's uh, classic story, um, O Youth, as well as uh, his story, Heart of Darkness, where you'll have a storyteller who's telling about Marlowe, the real storyteller, and so you have almost like a story within a story. So notice our word, our, our point of view here will come back to whoever it is that's saying he had one last thing to say to us. Now, who is the us and who is the seventh man? Maybe a recovery group of a kind, maybe? Notice he says, they tell us the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. But I don't believe that, he said. Then a moment later he added, oh, the fear is there, all right. It comes to us in many different forms at different times. It overwhelms us, but the most frightening thing we can do at such times, when we're really afraid, is to turn our backs on it, to close our eyes. Put it in your notes, the need to face fear, right? For then, we take the most precious thing inside us and surrender it to something else. In my case, that something was the wave. What is the powerful lesson here at 2A? We have to face our fears. We have to be willing to admit when we are afraid and live with those fears and try to find ways to accept those fears. We have said many times in 303, when something terrible happens, the question of theodicy in our big five, why do bad things happen? When bad things happen, we mustn't ask, why did this happen to us? Rather, we have to learn to ask, why did this happen for us? That is a compelling thing to do. And in a story like this, we watch this happen. He figures out there's got to be some meaning in it, and I've got to figure out what that is. Uh, of course, uh, at uh, to be rhetoric here, you can jot down the, the interesting way to tell a story within a story within a story, right? We really have three stories going on simultaneously. We have the man who is now an old man, standing in a group as the seventh man to tell his story, right? And he's going to explain what happened to him. Second story, what happened way back when. Third story, what happens at the very end, that is to say, the redemptive component. At 3A, we've mentioned a number of different titles. Um, what is for you your favorite story of survival, of somehow surviving a terrible situation and having to learn to live with tremendous fear? And finally, at 3B, well, it's an, obvious, it's an obvious story that you can identify with. What for you is the fear that you have had to face in your life, and somehow facing that fear has made you more incredibly aware of the preciousness of life? And then finally, of course, what is, what is the fear you still have to deal with? The fear that you still have to somehow come to terms with? And ultimately, how are you going to come to terms with those kinds of fears? That is to say, how are you going to deal with the challenge of those fears? The last word of that of the story is wave. Go back to page 133 and notice the opening lines. A huge wave nearly swept me away. And of course, quite literally that's true, but in a more compelling way, it swept away so much of his life. But notice, and I hope now you will circle the word you probably didn't circle when you started on 133, the word nearly. In other words, talking about it is a way to learn to deal with it. And in the process of confession, which is, of course, the story, it's confessional, yes, he comes to some redemption. I hope that you'll look at more of Marikami's great, great works. Truly compelling artist. Thank you.